Today is April 13th, 2014, and I'm sitting with my husband, Michael Dowd, I'm Connie Barlow, and Loyal Rue in Loyal Rue's cabin, uh, about 20 minutes north of his home in Decorah, Iowa. And this is the first time we have had a conversation since about 98 or something. That sounds about right. Yeah. And you... Have you ever met Lloyd? Well, I never met him in person. We talked on the phone once and exchanged about a half a dozen emails. Right, right. So here we are to talk about religious naturalism, and we're going to use um, Lloyd's 2011 book, Nature is Enough, Religious Naturalism and the Meaning of Life as a Take-Off Point. And I've specifically requested to do that because um, Lloyd really launched me on my epic of evolution path back in the early 90s with his first book, 1989, A Mythia, Crisis in the Natural History of Western Culture. And this is where I realized I was sick. And you may be sick and don't know it, but we're the first generations that haven't had a myth, a narrative, a sense of, of how the universe came to be, who we are, our identity, um, that is complete. We have this religious myths of various kinds, and we have science, and we have this cognitive dissonance. And, and, so, and in, in their current forms, both religion, uh, Western religions, and science, neither of them have succeeded in giving us an I, thou, a personal, honorable, respectful relationship to the natural world, which of course we've got to do pretty quickly, otherwise we're probably not going to survive for very long. Right, and Loyal is the, the scholar among the group here. Um, who's given Michael and, and me an opportunity to embed our understandings and how we bring it to audiences around the USA um, in a deeper understanding of history and how myth and values work together. Because Loyal has also done Religion is Not About God, How Spiritual Traditions Nurture Our Biological Nature and What to Expect When They Fail. And the way I introduce that book in my programs is I say that Loyal's written this book, well, Religion is Not About God, and what he means, among other things, is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has typically been personified as the various gods and goddesses, but what religion, if any religion uh, that, that will be of benefit, that will truly create personal wholeness and social coherence, has got to help people live in, and cultures live in right relationship to what's inescapably real. So all of us here, sitting here, now feel that we have that. We have fully embedded a scientific cosmology into our beings such that we have, putting in Loyal's terms, personal wholeness for dealing with suffering, uh, maintaining hope in personal and societal crises to some extent, um, and also social coherence where we realize that each of us has to play a role uh, at the age that we're at, we're in a position to do so, uh, to try to help bring this coherence into our culture such that we can systemically move through uh, primarily the environmental ills of our time, which other cultures haven't had to deal with at a global level. So how about if we begin, Loyal, uh, you chose this title, Nature is Enough. Actually, didn't somebody commission you to write a book as a response to Jack Hawk's book, Nature is Not Enough? Well, well actually, he, no. He, his, his, his book was called, Is Nature Enough? Question mark. Yeah, Is Nature Enough? Um, here's the story about that. I, uh, years ago, I had an idea for a book um, that, was, that would be titled, Is Nature Enough? And the idea was to collect uh, essays from various people in the world uh, to weigh in on that question. So some would say, yes, nature is enough. Others would say, nature is not enough. And the idea was that a book like that, a conversation about whether nature is enough, uh, could start some further conversation and, and make, uh, make this a, a more public issue. Um, and so I put together a, what I called a wish list of flashy thinkers, uh, at the top of which was uh, Stephen Hawking. And so I wrote to Stephen Hawking asking if he would submit a, a short essay on the question, is nature enough, and got a letter back uh, saying, sorry, um, 
Stephen is so busy with, you know, and, and is, is in such demand, uh, can't, can't come up with this. So I, I expected that, nevertheless, I was slightly disheartened enough so that I put the project in a file uh, and moved on to other things. So I didn't really pursue it. I didn't ask anybody else to. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Michael Cavanaugh, knew that I was trying to work on this book. And uh, after a couple of years of the file sitting in the back, uh, he, uh, he asked if he could use that phrase, is nature enough, that question, uh, as the title for a conference uh, on science and religion, Star Island Conference on Science and Religion. I said, well, of course I don't own that question. If they don't, go ahead and do it. So he organized a conference called, Is Nature Enough? and brought in speakers, mm -hmm. uh, some of whom uh, addressed uh, the positive and others the negative. Mm -hmm. Jack Haught, or John Haught, mm -hmm. um, was one of those who said, no, nature is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave a talk uh, at Star Island. Uh, a year later, uh, sure enough, uh, there appears a book by Jack Haught entitled, Is Nature Enough?, in which he um, is, I think, uh, rigorously objecting to religious naturalism. So I thought, okay, uh, that has to be answered. So one of the things motivating this book is uh, an attempt to, to, uh, to answer Jack Haught. Wow. Uh, the well, other... well, I am so grateful to Jack Haught because, I mean, I've been grateful for a long time for what he's done for within the Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. Very important what he's done there for bringing the evolutionary picture into it. Um, but if you hadn't written this book, except as a response to him, I would be deprived. Yeah. I love this book. Yeah. Well, the other, the other thing that motivated that book was, was this whole notion about the meaning of life. I had been teaching introductory philosophy students for years uh, uh, using textbooks and I noticed that the the newer textbooks always included a section which wasn't the case decades ago mm -hmm. a section on the meaning of life mm -hmm. uh, and and so I thought okay maybe I should turn to that question and, and uh, find out what that's about so I offered a high-level seminar on the meaning of life and we worked through all the literature mm -hmm. and I decided that it was pretty good <laughs> uh, so I didn't really feel I had anything to add to it. Uh, so then I thought, okay, I'll move on to the next thing on my list of things to look into, and uh, that was emergence theory. And so I immersed myself in emergence, uh, and in the process uh, it occurred to me that emergence theory offered, um, offered to, to me at least, uh, a platform for discussing religious naturalism mm -hmm. uh, in a way that could answer Jack Hawk's objections. And, and it also provided a way of raising the question about the meaning of life in a new way. So those two failed projects uh, were combined and yeah. this book is a result of that. That's great. I mean, one of the things that I've uh, had an ongoing dialogue with Jack, and we, we keep referring to Jack as Jack Haught. His name is actually John F. Haught, but those of us close to him know him as Jack. Um, but whenever I've written anything in the last two years of substance around religious naturalism specifically, uh, he's typically responded to me with a rather lengthy email detailing where he sees things differently. And we have a really cordial relationship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we did a podcast about a year and a half ago on... Um, on you know sort of the nature of supernaturalism versus naturalism, and he was trying, he was saying that he offered he was offering a third way in between the two. Right. But um, I find that it all it entirely depends on how you define nature, or how you think about nature. If if you think about nature as a just this material mechanistic, uh, uh, almost like a clockwork universe metaphor, then of course nature is not enough, if that's the way you think of nature, at least for somebody who's religious like Jack and, and other, many different religious people. Mm -hmm. But if, as I do, I think of nature as a secular word that we today use that wasn't used two or 3,000 years ago, there was no word, the Hebrews didn't have a word called nature. And much of what we mean when we use the word nature was encompassed in what they meant when they said Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that, you know, that's why I, I think the same thing with the word the universe. I was talking to Connie this morning about this. 
It's like the idea that did God create the universe, like as if that's a debate, is like is it's almost as goofy in my mind as saying did Uncle Sam create the government, and like debating whether that's a real question or not, because what we mean by universe. Cosmos or whatever is is what often was was meant by ancient peoples when they used divine words. They personified reality, either some aspect of reality or the whole thing. So, I um, uh, obviously I find myself as a religious naturalist. I find myself um, ever groping for more inspiring ways to talk about this evidential ecological right. evolutionary right. worldview. Um, and my challenge or my my rejection of what. What I sometimes say to audiences is, if somebody has any particular, any one religious view that gets them to the place of personal wholeness, social coherence, and, and, and inspire them to live in an ecologically integrous way, I'm fine with whatever metaphysics or theology gets them there. I only object when somebody says they need, that one need to have a uh, otherworldly or supernatural worldview, that there's some requirement. And I would be, and all three of us would be living examples that no, you can get to all the benefits, the emotional, psychological, and social benefits that religion or any worldview, otherworldly or spirituality or whatever, gets you to from a purely naturalistic, evidential, ecological. Yeah, you know, I think you're right that, that a lot depends on what people mean by nature. Uh, and I've found, uh, maybe you found the same thing, that um, when I encounter people who insist that nature is not enough, and if the conversation goes any further, it eventually comes out that their view of nature is quite impoverished. Nature is Absolutely. just, is just mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. and I like to call that the, the grunge view of nature, <clears throat> where nature is just stuff, uh, just completely uninteresting and inert yes, yes, and yes. passive stuff, and it becomes interesting only when the laws of nature are imposed upon the stuff, or the Word of God is imposed mm -hmm. upon the stuff. So the interesting part is not nature, uh, but the the supernatural, or the yeah. uh, or the the natural laws that come from who knows where uh, to whip nature into shape. Uh, and I think I, I fundamentally think that that's uh, that's a sad thing. Uh, if one takes a, what I would call a glitz view of nature rather than a grunge view of nature. Uh, you will see that the natural world, matter, uh, is pretty interesting stuff. Uh, and that's one of the things that I tried to bring out yeah, in this in this book and, uh, and in my response to Jack Hawk. One of the things that I've really appreciated about what both of you do, since you come from the scholarly side of both philosophy and religion, Michael, you come from both the religious side, but also have read a lot in the scholarly of theology um, I start with the science. I am just a concrete literalist when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And so when I hear or see a theologian telling, saying that someone who views the universe and doesn't have something higher than that can't possibly be fulfilled. Let's say someone who says you have to believe in some sort of immortality in your life, your beingness, in order to be fulfilled. Or I remember you interviewing uh, John Polkinghorne as a physicist uh, and an Anglican of his concern about the heat death of the universe, which I understand to be like trillions of years away. And to me, I'm going, wait a second, okay, you can have all these arguments, but I exist. This is fulfilling to me. I don't, nature is enough for me. And when I deliver the epic of evolution to kids, which is something I do and you two don't. That's my area of, of experience here. Um, I also know what goes on with kids, not just adults. I'm going, hey, nature is enough for them too. And so where I value both of you is that you do something I can't, and that's you go after those scholars, after those theologians, and you're saying, you can't say that as a generic statement about what humans need, because some of us don't. Some of us are real people, and for us nature really is enough. You know, and you I, bring that too. Uh, I, I think there are two things that are going on here in this question about is nature enough. One is intellectual, the other is more emotional or personal. Yes. The intellectual thing is that the, the sticking point that people can't get by is that, well, 
what created nature. There must be something that created nature because nature, uh, the laws of nature and the properties of matter and so on, cannot account for the laws of nature and the properties of matter. So nature cannot give an account of itself. So there must be some cause or some source of nature that is non-natural or supernatural. That, I think, is what what uh, confirms in some people's minds that nature is not enough mm -hmm. intellectually. Sure. Well, of course, one response to that is to say, well, then, if there is a supernatural source for nature that explains nature, what then can explain that supernatural force? And here we have the cosmological argument of God created nature. What created God? Well, this God, the super God. Well, then the super, super God, and you're off and running to an infinite... It's turtles all the way down. Right. So, <clears throat> so the, the religious naturalist would respond to all that by saying, uh, we've got to stop someplace, uh, so I'm going to stop with nature. And admit that nature cannot give an account of itself. Oh, I wouldn't be willing to admit that. Well, okay, we can talk about that. But I would mm -hmm. say that, that nature, you can't have a naturalist account of the origins and, and whatnot of, of nature. Wait, wait, a diff distinction there. I'm not going to let you just stop with that some people need to care a lot about yeah, the yeah, origins of, of nature yeah. versus what happened after the Big Bang and how the E-word, let's bring in the E-word here because yeah. this is huge, how emergence has happened at the cosmological level, at the geological planetary level, deeply at the biological level, and also at the cultural level. And so, again, I, you and I have had this talk, we had this talk yesterday, but I am not that kind of religious naturalist. I don't need that scholarly apparatus to where I start. You, and, and so, you, okay, well, the only point I was making is that, is that the intellectual concern about is nature is enough turns out to be the cosmological argument. Yeah. Uh, okay, Th so that, and that can be satisfied in a number of ways. Um, my way of satisfying that, that lost cause of infinite regress is to say, okay, I just accept that nature is the case, that the natural world is the case, and its supernatural origins, or where nature itself came from, is something I'm not going to try to answer. But then there's the emotional part, uh, that nature is not enough, because it seems to a, a lot of people that uh, the natural world, which is presented to most of us in terms of contemporary modern science, um, is is not sufficient to address our spiritual needs. Well, I think it is, um, and of course the work that you guys are doing, and a lot of other people are doing, is to try to uh, demonstrate in what ways uh, nature can be spiritually fulfilling. Jack Hodge's argument is that uh, religious naturalism is intellectually um, implausible, and emotionally or spiritually unsatisfactory. And that's uh, and, and it and is you, for him. Right, for him. And you in this book show that it isn't. Well, I tried to yeah, and, and, yeah. and the fact that we are living examples here of relatively intelligent, you know, experienced human beings, I mean this is evidential that Nature can be enough for the mm -hmm. human intellect mm -hmm. because the three of us are sitting here. Mm -hmm. We have different ways of doing mm -hmm. that, but that's evidence. Well, yeah, and my, I mean, I, I would even go a little bit beyond, uh, you know, I, I like the grunge versus glitch, or, or glitz uh, views of nature, but for me, I have a divine view of nature, that what we call nature, the ancients called God, or at least any God that only transcends nature is less than a God that, a concept of God that transcends and includes nature. Mm -hmm. When I speak to mostly religious audiences, what I'm trying to do is offer, not sort of debating these philosophical issues that you can, you know, I'm not interested in that, I'm more of a pragmatist. It's like, okay, what can we agree on? Uh, and I think one of the things we can agree on is that there's something wrong, whether you call it sin or whatever you want to call it, but there's something wrong by betraying future generations, by living in the present moment in such a way that future generations can't enjoy a quality of life. So that if we can start there, 
than saying that whatever else you may think of in terms of how you think of God, is nature enough, is God the same as nature, is that pantheism or penentheism, all the different godisms, screw all that. Let's all set that aside and say, okay, can we agree that it's a morally positive thing to do to live in right relationship with the air, water, soil, and life upon which we depend, and it's immoral to not do that, mm -hmm. and let's find those places of agreement, because frankly, I don't think we've got enough time uh, to battle the philosophical and theological and metaphysical issues. Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out ways to cooperate across ethnic, religious, political, philosophical differences to work together to do what we can to ensure a healthy right. future. Right, and that's your job. That's why Michael goes into Christian churches, I go into Unitarian churches, and you pretty much stay with colleges. Uh, we each have a different realm. Well, I also we speak in Unitarian churches. Oh, right, 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 right. But you're the you're the bridge there, and so you're trying to get you know the, the base, the pragmatic need to make it so that religions are not preventing a reasonable, self-sacrificial response to the future, given our environmental problem. Right now, the religions are preventing that. So you know you're working on that. But what this video about here is really for people who are already either persuaded by religious naturalism, who are toying with it, and want to get from us our sense of what it does for us, religious naturalism here. In some ways it must be frustrating when you address audiences uh, and try to initiate a conversation on the near side of metaphysics, to pick up a phrase from, from Ed Wilson. Oh, yeah. um, frustrating because Everybody has metaphysical commitments, and when you present them with something provocative, in, in the processing of that, they will back into their metaphysics. And so you can, you, metaphysics is always going to leak back into the conversation consistently, periodically. I mean, you can make a little advance in the conversation, but then pretty soon, the metaphysical commitments are in there blocking the conversation. And so it's always difficult to maintain or sustain um, a discussion on the new side of metaphysics. Not with kids. Not, yeah, and not, <laughs> not with kids. And not, and not in my experience. Uh, I, would, even I, with I, think, I think kids have metaphysical commitments. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, in my experience, and, and it's not like I've done extended follow-through or follow-up. So that two months after I'm at a place, I go back and interview people. I mean, I haven't done that. But because what I focus on almost entirely is just a purely evidential worldview that I interpret it divinely. So for me, evidence is modern-day scripture or whatever. But, but evidence, I hold evidence up and I say, okay, here, and I speak it in as enthusiastically as I can, here is the most inspiring way that I can think of to interpret what science, the global collective intelligence of humanity right now is offering. Thus and, saith the evidence. Well, yeah, well, and, and I even, I, exactly, and I even, I even say things at the, toward the end of my program, I say, thus saith the Lord, like, mm -hmm. here's what reality is saying to us today through evidence. And one of the things, as I shared yesterday, is that nature is my secular name, obey my laws or perish. Mm -hmm. You know, evidence should be considered modern-day scripture, so things like that. So, my point, though, is that when I speak to religious people who likely have a pretty strong metaphysical nourishment, something nourishes them from a metaphysical perspective, I am meeting them on the near side of metaphysics, and I'm doing so in a way that whether their metaphysics is Christian or New Age or Buddhist or whatever, they can take, because I'm, offer, I'm coming to this part of the line and saying, here's what I have to offer. And for people who are secular or free thinkers or atheists or humanists or religious naturalists, but they're not, they don't have any other worldly belief system, they, that's enough for them. But for the Christians, or the Buddhists, or the New Agers, or whoever else, they take what I offer and then they bring it back and filter it through whatever their perspective is. Okay, well, let me ask this question. I mean, this is interesting. On the one hand, you want to be a pragmatist and conduct your affairs on the new side of metaphysics. On the other hand, you're interested, in, you, you are yourself a naturalist, and part of your program is to... Um, aid people in transposing their Christianity or their Judaism or whatever onto a naturalistic foundation. Correct. I'm trying okay, to make it so you are trying to bring them from the near side of metaphysics into your 
naturalistic metaphysical world. I Naturalism to, is a metaphysical commitment. No, I understand that. But it's, a, it's I don't care that they let go of their supernaturalism or not, as long as they don't privilege that over natural. If they privilege something otherworldly over living in right relationship with the air and water cell and life of this planet, then that's wrong. That's morally mm -hmm. wrong in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make it as effortless as it was for me to go from supernatural beliefs, otherworldlyism, mm -hmm. where, the, where that was really important to me, to where I'm now a thoroughgoing religious naturalist, and I have no otherworldly or supernatural beliefs whatsoever. Mm -hmm. In fact, I see supernatural as a Western category that only emerged mm -hmm. in consciousness some 500 years ago when we began to understand things naturally. I've been very much influenced by uh, Benson Saylor's uh, 1977 ethos paper called The Supernatural is a Western Category in that regard. But it, as long as people value ensuring a healthy future, a healthy planet, and as long as they don't privilege ancient text over evidence, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter to me. I, so in that sense, I'm not trying to convert them, but I am trying to make it as effortless as it was for me to go from where what really matters with the supernatural to what really matters is the natural. And for me, there was no trauma. There was no... So how does one handle that question about um, privileging the ancient text over evidence? Because people will argue that the Bible or the Quran or whatever uh, text they're looking at is evidence. Well, how uh, I do it... And how do you get them off of, off of the view that this text is evidence that can be used in an argument against naturalists or whatever. Well, the way that I do it is I mock them. I, I actually scorn. I say, you betray God by imagining that God's best guidance was 2,000 years ago rather than all forms of evidence interpreted collectively. So I, I take on being very confrontive in situations like that where I'm saying God is bigger than that. God is more real. That if you think God spoke more clearly to ancient shepherds and, 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 and herders than through the global collective intelligence, what kind of a God is that? Okay. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me say you're both right in that, in that what Michael is talking about is what his ultimate concern is and what he's trying to achieve with his work in the world. But I have also seen the way that he presents things, given where the audience is coming from, he, he, he will flex it. And I have also seen him actually achieve in even a sermon sometimes, but usually in a longer program, someone coming in where their supernatural metaphysical beliefs are just accepted. They've been a part of their life. And by the end of his program, they're willing to give those up. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, I think he does both. On the one hand, he is trying to have more people become religious naturalists and become excited by it and see that nature is enough. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, his ultimate goal is just to motivate people to not diss nature yeah. and think there's something more important than nature or go to the ancient religions to try to find the values and virtues that we need enough in these times and yet in these times we need a scientific understanding and an ability to trust the community of science to go beyond our own perceptions about what we see in the world around us and telling us there is invisible gas called carbon dioxide and methane going into the atmosphere and trust me folks this is going to screw future generations mm -hmm. we cannot rely on human perception anymore or saying hey the Huns are coming over the hill run for cover you know no this is big, and so we have to get people to privilege evidential, um, self-correcting, worldwide, peer-reviewed, skeptical science for deciding how we move into the future. Well, well we see um, in our lifetime um, the critical mass of public opinion that it will take to flip Wall Street and to flip Washington D.C. to flip. I mean, we know that that uh, it's a dire outlook for the future. In forty or fifty years, uh, it could be widespread misery. We know this. The environment is going to hell in a handbasket in a hurry. But those people that are that are principal deciders. <laughs> Um, in in um, 
in worsening that problem, namely uh, business, especially oil, oil and gas, and industry. oil and gas, right, and um, and their um, handmaidens mm -hmm. in Washington D.C. will not let the conversation penetrate deeply enough. I mean, they they may tweak the EPA things a little bit and satisfy themselves that they've done what they can do for nature, uh, but they're not doing anything. Okay. Will we in our lifetime? I think it'll happen in the next five years. Will we experience uh, enough critical mass in public opinion to really put the pressure on on Wall Street? I, I say Wall Street and Washington D.C. Just to sure. yeah, I think it'll happen in the next five years. But what's fascinating is that you would ask a question, and what you're demonstrating is the consistency of your philosophical underpinnings. It's always this deep philosophical questioning. Michael and I are hardcore activists right now. Mm -hmm, I know that. We are yeah. using this out there. And so the question doesn't really come up, will we be successful? No. We have each discovered something we can do um, that we feel skilled at, we have an audience for, and we feel compelled to do. And whether we're successful doesn't even, or have a potential to be successful, isn't even in it isn't. It's more a Buddhist thing. Right action, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Don't even ask yeah. about whether it's going to come out. Yeah, I mean, my, my, fav my two favorite authors on the topic of sort of the present and likely future are John Michael Greer, who I've read about eight of his books in the last year and a half, and Kai and I read his blog posts you know, practically every day, his past ones. But also um, Paul Gilding. And Paul Gilding, uh, Tom Friedman at the New York Times said basically if you read one book on climate change, Make It Paul Gilding's The Great Disruption. The subtitle is uh, How the Climate Crisis Will Bring on the End of Shopping and the Birth of a New World. He's the former head of Greenpeace. And he's been working with mostly corporate CEOs um, uh, for the last 15 years, as well as some of the, the, the principal writers of the Club of Rome, uh, Limits to Growth, and stuff like that, Jorgen Randers. And he, uh, he's got me convinced. His, his book, The Great Disruption, I've read three times. I've read once in, paper, in paperback, and then I listened to it twice. And um, he talks about, that it, it, as he and Jorgen Randers and others assess, that like a dam, where the pressure on the dam is more and more, and once the dam breaks, the floodwaters are unstoppable. And he thinks sometime between now and 2018, the dam of denial around climate change will break. And when that happens, China, Israel, the European Union, Brazil, the United States, everybody will be mobilized like we were at the beginning of World War II. And he actually believes that we will not, we will not tolerate two degrees Celsius. He calls it the one degree Celsius war plan. Mm -hmm. And he and others, major world leaders and people in business, have been formulating now for years, for over a decade, this one degree war plan. So that when the dam of denial breaks, there is no denial anymore then we can mobilize around this. And I think it will be, uh, I, I really do believe it will be in the next five years, and um, I think it will be a, a, a kickstart to the economy, which I don't, I, I, I'm not Pollyannish. I think that we, when looking 50 years out, there is going to be, we're not li living in the same world anymore. I think Bill McKibben is right in his book, Earth, E-A-A-R-T-H, mm -hmm. that the world that we will inhabit, as long as humans are around for the next 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 years, is nothing like the Earth that we right. Inherited the Holocene, yeah. but I do believe that the current impasse politically and uh, in the business world has got a half a dozen years at most, and and that's not just a pipe dream. It's because there's a lot of people been putting a lot of serious thought mm -hmm. into this, mm -hmm. and um, so. Well, let's see. Yeah, I'd like to get back to you um, because it's a, a point you raise in this book. The distinction again between glitz and grunge view of nature and naturalism. Um, make that clear again for us. Uh, well, the, the grunge view of matter uh, is, is uh, I call it the grunge view. It's not a, it's not a sophisticated metaphysical analysis <laughs> uh, by any means, but the grunge view of matter is that matter is this inert stuff that's uninteresting and uh, doesn't uh, have any creative power uh, in itself until the laws of nature uh, sort of whip it into shape and make it interesting and organize it and so on. I think I, I think that's a 
impoverished view, and the view I take is that there are no laws of nature. I mean, this uh, grunge theory basically gives us a dualism of matter and spirit, or matter and law. Um, and I think that, that that's misled. Um, and so I would prefer to say that what we have is, we don't have any laws of nature that are out there uh, whipping matter into shape. What we have is matter. And matter has certain properties. And when we notice that these properties have regularities, we formulate those regularities and that becomes a law of nature, something it is our perception of regularity in the properties of matter. So you've got matter and, and properties. And so the Glitz view is to say that, uh, th that matter is interesting stuff because it has these wonderful properties. Uh, and those properties, once they interact and, um, and reorganize, will produce new properties and then you get more interaction and further properties of, of matter emerge uh, and that's the, the emergence view uh, which gives us new properties enabling further properties which enable further properties and, and so on and so you get actually you get new laws of nature right. uh, so that would be the glitch view and if, if you take that view then you, then it, it appears that matter or nature is enough uh, if it has that creative potential uh, in it. Well, thank you for that because that's that's an apparatus beneath which I usually work, pretty much as a concrete literalist, someone who takes the science. And what I would like to emphasize here is that that abstract apparatus that you just laid out for us religious naturalists, which I'm glitz, I mean, I love mm -hmm. it. It sounds that way, and I love the word emergence, that the new can come out, something more than can come out of the less than, through dynamics and constraints and all this. But what I love to think about, as a Unitarian Universalist, Thomas Jefferson, our president Thomas Jefferson, just is also an incredible naturalist and, and um, someone who worked in all the scholarly realms He's often criticized and said, well, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He was a deist, okay? So he was president in the early 1800s. And they said, well, Thomas Jefferson didn't think nature was enough. He was a deist. He thought something came before, something was outside. And I go, let's talk about the history of science here. Nobody could be a logically consistent, emergentist, nature is enough person, prior to at least 1859 with Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. Because there we had the understanding, the first opportunity to move out of a, a presupposition of a mechanistic universe. A designer is the only way you get something greater than the materials that went into it. Darwin was the first opportunity to say, oh, other than the origin of life, that spark of life, I can see how diversity and even complexity could arise. So that was big. That was our first chance to move beyond deism. And then when I was in kindergarten, I always talk about this, when I was in kindergarten, so this would be 1957-58, that's when science came up with the next big discovery that would help the emergentist, nature's enough position, um, have an evidential ground. And that was the understanding for the very first time of how atoms more complex than hydrogen and helium could come into being. Mm -hmm. And that was the notion that inside the ancestral stars that took the big bangs, hydrogen and helium, gravity was enough to be able to move the hydrogen into helium and then the helium squeeze it into carbon and the helium and the carbon into silicon and all the way through and the red giants and the supernovas making the final amount and we, we've got nuances mm -hmm. since 1958 boom we had emergence of complex matter and then in my lifetime very recently uh, um, you would know more about the cultural and the, and the human realm but very recently, this is huge, there was always the concern of, well, maybe life is so contingent, so rare. How do we know there's any planets out there? Well, in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. 
Nobody ever thought we would have the perception, the technological tools to do it. And now we've discovered, primarily with Kepler tel um, telescope, we've discovered statistically not only how many planets there are, but that there are Earth-like planets rather common. Mm. And so at every stage of the game, the opportunity to, for nature to be enough has been moving and moving and moving ahead in all realms. And so whenever anyone tries to go back and discuss, is nature enough, without this understanding of the concrete discoveries of science mm -hmm. and what they've done, I go, wait a minute, let's talk about the history of science. Yeah, yeah. One of the ways that I've been talking a lot about sort of this whole question of nature as a grunge root view or a blitz view, I mean, for me, um, the idea of nature as creative, that the universe itself has creativity at all scales in a nested sort of way. And so the idea of creativity, that is ultimate creativity, as only focusing on how did the universe come into being, ignoring that we've got 13.82 billion years of, of, of evidence, tons of evidence, of creativity happening at all scales. Uh, again, it, 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 it's counterproductive. It's, it helps us, uh, or almost forces people to, to not pay attention, kind of like the magician who you're watching this hand, so you're not paying attention to what's over here. It's like if we're thinking about what happened, how did the universe come into being, or how did life, whatever, and we're not present to these innumerable examples of creativity, then we're also not going to be present to where is reality, God, the universe, ultimacy, whatever, where is that creativity showing up now? Who are those who are speaking on behalf of reality and living in right relationship to reality? There's a whole realm of things that we're just ignoring or not paying attention to because we're arguing about sort of these large-scale philosophical and theological questions. Let's set aside some of those bigger issues and say, where are we out of right relationship to reality now? How did we get here and how can we move forward? in ways that deeply motivate us to sort of ins uh, enlarge in our circle of care, compassion, and commitment to include the whole body of life. The fact that Richard Dawkins and I actually are playing very different roles in the body of life and Jack Hott and I are playing different roles in the body of life, I can actually celebrate the roles that each of them are playing even though they're constantly fighting with each other because I think that there's lots of roles that need to be played and what they agree on is actually far more important. I mean, I find Jack to be He's been a, an older brother on the path for me since 1988, I think, which is when I first read him, because in terms of ecological theologian and evolutionary theologian within the, the Christian realm, he's pretty amazing. And even though we have different philosophical positions and metaphysical positions, I'm a thoroughgoing religious naturalist, and he thinks that's, well, that's somehow not adequate, I don't care about those differences because the, the places that we do agree are so profound and so important that I say, let's just set that stuff aside. And, you know. mm -hmm. One of the things I'd like both of you to reflect on is that the reason that you had to write Nature is Enough and the reason that you speak differently um, and are looking to bridge and be more inclusive for the ecological imperative rather than just spend all your time like Dawkins and Harris and so forth of trying to beat religion to death, um, that there's a deeper issue there, is that in general, in Western culture, at least here in America, people grew up with some traditional metaphysical beliefs imposed on them. Now, reading the last part here, Confessions of a Religious Naturalist, where you talk about your own childhood and your own questioning, obviously you became a philosopher, okay? But not everybody does. Obviously, I went into the sciences because I don't have that predisposition. But my view all along is that whatever difficulties we have of moving audiences to become enough of a religious naturalist, to make a difference now for what we need in this world, pay attention to nature, reverence for nature, this is, this is ultimate. Once we get to the point where, where we can start becoming the major influence, religious naturalism, inspiringly put forth, of how children are raised, that they can be, their innate fascination with dinosaurs and nature and all these kind of things they see, put into an inspiring context of what we call the epic of evolution um, or big history, 
they're not going to be willing to give that up for any mm -hmm. metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to show right here for a moment, because Goyle has never seen these. When I turned 50, Michael and I both made concrete vestige of the entire story of the universe. So each bead signifies some significant event in the universe story right. of history. Okay. So, you know, she can tell the whole story bead by bead if she wants. Right, to. right. And so on here, the Big Bang starts here, and then I've got uh, galaxies forming, ancestor stars that formed, all the atoms from hydrogen and helium, these made the complex atoms, out of which our sun then came, and our sun could have planets around it because of the ancestor stars creating the complex atoms, and onto Earth and so forth, first photosynthesis. I love the way this wasn't intended. She's got the major extinctions represented. Yeah, halfway through here is a dinosaur extinction. Oh, that's a great idea. You can pull that out and, and, and talk to children. Oh, she does. And, and more and, than and, that. And lots of other people Right, too. right. And I do this in church services, but one of the main things I'm trying to do with kids, that if, you, if I can do this with kids, they'll be immune, completely immune to being taken off course from having nature is enough and nature is their main one. And that is I give them identity yeah. that's very different from what all of us got, you know, whether it was conservative or very liberal Christian upbringing, and I got. And I always show them, I say, here's where I was born, you know, and after this came the discovery of DNA. And I am as much of the story as anything yeah, in right, here. Right. No, you know? it's a great image. But now I get a further image of, of you going, addressing a a congregation in a Roman Catholic church and having a war with a rosary. Uh, oh, no, actually, oh. I mean, what, what's fascinating is that this was co independently co-invented by several people. Yeah. In fact, some of the Catholics call it a cosmic rosary. A cosmic we rosary. wouldn't have thought of it had, had not the nuns, the earth-centered nuns who were inspired by Thomas Berry, they were the ones who came up with it, and also a secular woman yeah. in um, Seattle, and then we just ran with it yeah. and came... And let came let me... Uh, back up just a little bit. You accuse me of being a philosopher as, as, as being some, some, <laughs> as a sort, derogatory of, some sort of alien. In, no, no, in, I need you because uh, I need you to produce this book. I, I don't think there. I don't think not being a philosopher is an al is an alternative for anyone. We're all philosophers. Uh, and I think, I mean, we're not all academic philosophers who dig and dig and dig, but everybody has to um, evaluate arguments and evidence that, that pertain to those things which they regard to be ultimately meaningful. Everybody does. Yeah, but, but some Little kids do it. Look, no, exactly. a former yeah. professor of mine, uh, Gareth Matthews, who was an undergraduate teacher of mine, uh, has spent a long career uh, doing uh, philosophy of children, mm -hmm. and or philosophy for children, and he's he's convinced that kids do. There's a lot of stuff coming out now. Even even infants do philosophy. Well, so. yeah, I think we agree about that. I just want you to know that I see what you've done in your life as being absolutely essential for me to be able to do what I do without having to attempt to create whole cloth, something that mm -hmm. I'm not interested in doing mm -hmm. and I'm not good at. I can take what you do, have a platform from which I then take the sciences and make it interesting for myself mm -hmm. and memorable for kids. Mm -hmm. I, I like that you take what I do. I do. I would not like it if you took what I do without a critical eye. Well, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah I mean, yeah. But, Connie's read very widely and pretty deeply in philosophy of science, philosophy... And history of science. Right. Right. I know that. Right, And right. so, yeah, she brings that kind I of... I chose you, and I don't always agree with you, as you know. I don't always agree with you. That's why your first book and your last book are my favorites, because there's some books in between that I don't necessarily agree with. So I do have a critical eye. Okay, good. But see, I prefer my mentors to not be perfect. Otherwise, they get turned into gods and things. You are not perfect. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. As, as, my, as my increasingly full bladder will attest. <laughs> All right, let's take a break.